Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is quite a heavy one and I'd just like to put in a disclaimer here that if you're very sensitive to child abuse, I mean horrific child abuse, and child deaths, then this may not be the video for you. I'd advise you to go and check out a different one instead. That being said, the case that I'm going to look into today is the horrific case of Victoria Columbia. This case was actually a suggestion by Heather. So thank you so much for that. I enjoy any suggestions you guys have. I'd just like to let you know I've gathered all the information off the internet. I mean no disrespect whatsoever to anyone I'm going to talk about today. And I've just gathered the information to make into a video for educational purposes. Victoria Adjo Klimbier was born on the 2nd of November in 1991. She was born in Obobo, which is in the Ivory Coast in Africa, and she was one of seven children. Her father was called Francis and her mother was called Bertha. I apologise if I pronounce any of these names incorrectly, I struggle with pronunciation sometimes. So please just bear with me. Now, Victoria was such a happy little girl, she was always smiling. And when I say always, I truly mean always. She would often sing and dance around the streets. She was just this vibrant, lovely little girl who was just always happy. She was such a happy child. Victoria actually spoke two languages. She spoke her native language and also she spoke French because her country was part of an ex-French colony. Marie Therese Kawai was actually Victoria's great aunt who lived in France. She had three sons and basically a brother had passed away and so she came over to Ivory Coast to attend his funeral and that's when she decided that she was going to visit distant relatives and she ended up visiting the Columbia family. This was in October 1998. Victoria's father was actually Marie Therese's nephew and they had only met a couple of times really. So basically Marie Therese actually offered to take one of their children over to France to provide them with a better education. Now her parents jumped at this. It was often done within countries like this. They lived in quite a poor area. They had seven children. It probably would have been the only chance that they got to at least send one of their kids off to get a really good education so that they could just try and do really well for themselves with this good education that they were receiving. The families basically always wanted more for their children, which is what everybody wants. So they agreed and they actually chose Victoria. And by all accounts, she was really happy to go. She, like I said, she was ecstatic and she was quite excited to go to France. Now, there was an actual child that Marie Therese was actually supposed to take before Victoria. And this child was called Anna Kowu, but her parents actually changed their mind and they wouldn't allow their daughter to go. Now, Marie Therese had made this fake passport for Anna and everything, it had a picture on. And so when they agreed that she would take Victoria, she just tried making Victoria look a bit more like Anna, who had long hair bearing in mind and Victoria had really short hair. So she went out, she bought her extensions. She just tried to make her a lot, look a lot more like the photograph in the passport because she didn't want to change it. And that's actually how she would become to be known as throughout the rest of her life. She was known as Anna instead of Victoria. Now I guess this was the very first failing for Victoria because she was allowed to travel with this fake passport that the picture was definitely not her all around Europe and it was never flagged up. She was just waved on through, which obviously should not have happened. Little did anyone know that she didn't want Victoria to give her a better education. She just wanted her to help her gain better access to the state for things like benefits back in France. Because in her mind, having like a young dependent would give her more priority on things like housing and things like that. So the pair left Ivory Coast in November of 1998 and they flew to Paris where Marie-Thérèse would actually enroll her into school. Finally, Victoria was getting the education that she was there for. Well, after only a month of being there, the school noticed that actually she was barely ever there. They decided that they'd get in touch and she just basically said it was because she was a naughty child and that was it. Four months passed by and like I said, Victoria was barely ever there. And in February of 1999, they started beginning to think that something was off. They didn't really believe that she was never in school because she was naughty. Because well, when she was in school, 
she was this polite little girl. She was so well behaved. She was always so happy and jolly. And they just couldn't put that together with her mother, which is who she did become known as, would state for her saying that she was this naughty little girl. They just didn't see it. And because of this, they got in touch with the authorities. They assumed that maybe there was actually a problem at home. This is the first instance as to when a social worker got involved with Victoria. And Victoria was actually labelled as a child at risk from an abusive home. They noticed that she was so tired to the point where she would basically just pass out during class and in school. She would just constantly fall asleep anywhere and everywhere. It was as if she physically could not stay awake. In March, her teachers actually noticed that her head was shaved and she was wearing a wig. On the 25th of March in 1999, Mary Therese had this conversation with the teacher saying that basically she wore this wig because she had a really, really bad skin condition and that they had shaved her head because it would make her head a lot easier to treat that way. And after this conversation, she wouldn't return to school. And then on the 24th of April, Mary Therese just bundled up Victoria with a few of her things and they fled to Erling, London in England. You'll find that throughout this case that there's kind of a running theme that no matter what Mary Therese said, everyone just believed her. And I really don't know why, but they just did. Basically, she'd not been paying her rent over in France and she owed them over to the government over £2,000 in false claim benefits. Now, when they arrived in England, they initially stayed in a BB and and then they ended up in a hostel in northwest London. Bearing in mind, Victoria didn't speak a word of English. After arriving, the pair went to go and see a distant relative of Marie Therese called Esther, who was a counsellor, a midwife and a preacher. She did notice that Victoria, who was responding to Anna, because obviously that's what how she was introduced to everyone, that's kind of what she was groomed to answer to, was very frail, she was very weak looking, and she was also very small. But at the same time, she didn't really think much of it because she was seven year old, little girls can be so active, running around all the time, sometimes they can be very slender because they're that active that the weight just kind of drops off them and some children are like that naturally, are more on the slender side where no matter what they eat, they just don't put on the weight. She did notice that Anna was wearing a wig though. And there were little blisters on the head and he said the child had some um, uh, either hot water accident or something. The child was quite happy wearing the wig. I mean, she had no reason really to doubt Marie Therese. This little girl seemed so happy, happy, so bubbly. She was always smiling. And because of this, she was just inclined to believe her and that this had just been an accident. Marie Therese actually went on to attend over 20 different meetings with the government. And these were all to get things to try and help her and Victoria to live. So benefits, trying to get sort of government paid housing, things like that. And on at least 10 of these occasions, Victoria actually attended with her. The staff on numerous occasions noted Victoria's unkempt appearance. With one staff member, Deborah Garn, thinking she actually looked like a child from an Action Aid poster. Now, Action Aid, for those who may not know, is actually an international non government organisation that kind of works against poverty and injustice. But once more, they didn't really act on it because they just thought that Mary Therese was purposely dressing her child like that to gain sympathy because a lot of people would come in they would dress all scruffy and things like that to try and get them to in their own words hand over the money this was the first chance they had to save Victoria there will be 11 more on the 8th of June in 1999 Marie Therese got a full-time cleaning job working in Norwich Park Hospital and while she was at work, what would she do with Victoria? A seven-year-old little girl that needed to be looked after. What did she do with her? Well, she just left her home, on her own. While she would often work minimum six hours a day, often more than that. And Victoria was just left alone. She wasn't put into any education. She wasn't put into a childminder. She was just left at home to her own devices. And that's just so wrong. Not only that. Social, early social services also didn't try and get her into education. Nobody seemed to just do anything throughout this case and you will, you'll see it for yourself. 
if you don't already know about this case. These social services are supposed to be there to protect, protect children that are potentially at risk of harm or abuse and they just didn't do anything. Having a child not be looked after while a parent or guardian was working at the age of seven is just unacceptable. Like I said, there's going to be many recognised failings throughout this case and it's just so sad. Now, after a few weeks of working at a new job, she actually did meet a, new, a woman called Priscilla Carmen and Priscilla actually agreed to look after Victoria while she was at work. So finally, this seven-year-old girl actually had somewhere to go. Priscilla actually had a son called Patrick and Victoria really took a shine to him. She absolutely adored him. And whenever she was with them, she was like her old self again. She was happy, she was singing, she was dancing. She just loved being around that house. But when it was time to go home, when Mary Therese came to collect her, there was a noticeable tension straight away. She was suddenly withdrawn and quiet. And as soon as she got there, she began speaking to her in French. So obviously nobody could understand her. And Priscilla said it looked like she was telling her off in a way. She looked like she was shouting at her. And literally when you just come and pick up your child that's not really done anything wrong, you just, your initial thing is to go in and shout at them. Usually you run up and have a hug and say I've missed you, but no, she didn't do that. And Priscilla began to notice little cuts and little marks kind of appearing on her hands and things like that. And a few times she actually asked them, asked Mary Therese about them. And she just always managed to explain them away. Now, get this. She said that Victoria liked to play with blades. And that was how she had been getting all of these cuts. Which is totally absurd. What seven-year-old child plays with blades? And does this child not have toys to play with? Because why would the option be to play with blades over a doll? Who in their right mind would even put blades, if say a child had got hold of a blade and accidentally cut themselves, who would then keep blades in reach of the child so they could just keep doing it? You just wouldn't. This child was clearly being neglected and each time it was just explained away and then people didn't really think much of it and it's just totally unbelievable. A bit later on, if you recall Marie Therese's distant relative Esther, well, they bumped into her again on the street and she noticed some very worrying things about Victoria. I noticed a scar on the right cheek and I said, what's happened to the child, you know, this bruising or scar? And she told me that the child um, fell from escalator. They were going to the city and fell now and the escalator called the bruising. She grew very suspicious and she decided that in three days she was going to go and visit their home, the hostel, to basically look at their living conditions because she was worried about her. It had literally been six weeks since she last saw Victoria and she had lost even more weight, she seemed even more frail. It concerned Esther so much that she felt like she needed to take action. So the next day she rang social services, she told them anonymously about the concerns that she had and they said that they would file a referral that same day. Three weeks passed by and nothing had happened, there was no real difference, nothing had been done. So Esther decided to call them again to see how things were coming along. They said that social services had probably done something about it. Probably done something about it. Are you joking? They didn't provide any evidence to say that they had actually done something about it. This second call didn't even trigger another referral or an update to the original referral, which it should have definitely done. At the very least, social services just completely let Victoria down. It was three weeks after her initial call that Victoria's details were finally entered into the system. Reading into this case, I just found it so unbelievable. It's just totally unacceptable to leave a vulnerable child that is potentially being abused for three weeks without literally even entering the name into the system. I mean, three weeks could actually be the difference between a child being abused and for Victoria, it actually was. A non-professional member of the public had actually raised the alarm and still nothing was done. In June 1999, Mary Therese caught a buzz. He actually got chatting to the driver. He seemed very friendly and he befriended the pair. This man was called Carl Manning. They began a relationship and literally after only three weeks of knowing each other, Victoria and Mary Therese moved in with Carl. This was on the 6th of July in 1999. And Carl literally lived in a one bedroom flat in Tottenham and this marks the beginning of Victoria's long and horrific journey to an early grave. 
On the 7th of July, which was literally the day after they had just moved, social services sent a letter to the hostel saying that they were gonna come for a home visit. Well, this was already too late because they just moved literally the day before. So like I said before, those three weeks may have made all the difference. Well, they probably would have made all the difference and that just completely breaks my heart. If her information had been entered into the system when the car first came through, maybe they could have done the home visit much sooner and they may still have been in the hostel at that time. It could have potentially saved a life. I know that when she received this letter, she could have panicked and grabbed Victoria and run, but she wouldn't have really had anywhere to go, whereas now she had Carl's to go to and that's where she went. So on the 17th of July, social services went to the hostel, but obviously the pair went there. They were told that they had moved out and rather than try and follow it up, try and ask questions as to where they were, try and find this woman that was abusing potentially this child, they didn't bother, they just left it there. Hey, they've gone. Let's just give up on this potential child abuser. That's basically what they did. Now, the two social workers that attended, Laurie Hobbs and Monica Bridgman, hadn't actually done any research into the pair's background. They said that they went there with only the haziest idea of what they were investigating, which I don't understand. Esther rang and told them all of their concerns. How was that hazy? They made no attempt to follow up or contact them. They did one thing though, they wrote in the notes and they just put, not at this address, have moved. And that was it, that was all they did. As they were, this was all happening, the trio were kind of just getting sort of used to living with each other. And the conditions that they were living in were potentially worse than what they were living in at the hospital. So his flat was, like I said, it one bedroomed. There were now three people living in it. He had kind of a very small kitchen. He had quite a small bathroom and he had this one bedroom, which had a double bed in for him and Mary Therese. And he also had a sofa bed, which would be for Victoria. So it was pretty cramped. And Carl, from the very beginning, made it clear that he didn't like Victoria and he certainly did not want her around. He would say it all the time, and Marie Therese really didn't need much of an excuse to try and get rid of Victoria. She was already abusing her, and not feeding her enough, and things like that. Anyway, on the 13th of July, after literally being at this flat for one week, she bundled up Victoria's things, and she carted her off to Priscilla's. She laid it on thick that she'd just moved in, that she was struggling, things like that. She even said that Carl didn't want her there. So basically, if Priscilla wanted to keep her and raise her as her own daughter, that she could do. Now, what I really don't understand is if she really didn't want Victoria, why did she not just send her back to her parents in Africa? Why did she feel the need to do all these things? She tried to get rid of her once. Why not just send her back to her parents? But the only thing I can think of in relation to that is her parents did think that she was in good health. They did receive three messages from Marie Therese stating this, so whether because she was now so skinny and abused that they didn't want to raise the alarm, that's why they didn't, I just don't know. But she literally tried to palm this beautiful, happy little girl off on anyone she could. Like it was an unwanted toy or something like that. So Priscilla basically said that she couldn't raise Victoria and that she would keep her the night, but in the morning she'd have to find something else for her. The, mo the moment she came in to Priscilla's house, they noticed a severe decline in her health. She had this hat on and Priscilla's mother actually said to Anna, because that's how she was known as, Anna, take off your hat, you're inside the house, you don't need it on. And that's when they noticed these injuries. They could tell that some were fresh, meaning that she had recently been beaten. There was this huge burn over her right cheek that was kind of healing. And there was a cut over her right eye, which was that bad that kind of a flap of skin was dangling down from it. There was just so many cuts, bruises, injuries, scars, all littering this tiny little girl's body. It was horrific to see that. And out of all this, this girl was smiling. Yeah. The next morning, her daughter Avril was that worried about Victoria that she decided to take her to the hospital. The doctors examined Victoria from head to toe and because she had so many injuries, it took a full two hours. And to do this exam, obviously they had to take off her clothes, which Priscilla had never seen before and her family had never seen before because, well, she only looked after her. She would have never needed to take her clothes off. 
And they were just hiding so many more injuries. She had cigarette burns all over her thighs. She had this huge mark across her entire back and the back of her legs, as if she'd been beaten with something. The doctors certainly thought that this was definitely not accidental. And so they put her on a ward and they contacted social services. They even asked Victoria how she'd gotten these injuries and she told them that she'd done it to herself, which they didn't believe. She couldn't have possibly done all of these to herself, especially those like on her back that she just simply couldn't reach. And that's really sad. It was as if she was that frightened and that groomed to say that she'd done it herself. That it was just natural instinct for her to say those words rather than to actually tell the truth as to what had actually happened to her. So Mary Therese, her mother, was called to the hospital to see social services and when she got there she basically blamed everything on the fact that her daughter had scabies, which is an itchy skin condition that can cause rashes and things like that and they're just very, very itchy. So she basically said that all these were caused by her itching. And many of the doctors didn't believe this, they didn't believe that they were self-inflicted or accidental. But what happened next I found completely unbelievable. One doctor called Ruby Schwartz, who was a senior consultant by the way, actually went on to diagnose Victoria with scabies. She didn't even speak to Victoria. She just said, yep, yeah, she's got scabies. Oh, and the cigarette burns that are on her thighs that the doctors actually confirmed were cigarette burns? No, that must be scabies too. Once more, Victoria had been failed by the adults in her life that could have potentially done something to stop this abuse. The adults around her that had the power to stop this just didn't. How can someone think that these burns on her face and the cigarette burns, the clear cigarette burns on her thighs were caused by her itching due to scabies? I will never understand that. So because of this, Another doctor went on to write to social services, basically saying that they made a mistake and there was no longer any need to look into this case. It's just complete and utter negligence at its finest. And I'm not gonna lie, it made me quite angry when I was researching this case. Before this letter was sent in, a social worker did actually pick up Victoria's case and they were rightly worried about her. But when this letter came in, stating that this medical professional professional had diagnosed her with scabies and that was why that was the cause of the so-called abuse she just dropped it but she trusted this medical profession which you would do they literally trained for so many years to be put in such a powerful position you would trust them and so that was the end of that so many people let her down so many people didn't check things and they just kind of let everything slide and they believed what Mary Therese was telling them which was complete lies and ultimately it ended up with such a tragic end. The morning after Victoria was admitted she was discharged again back into Mary Therese's care and Carl Manning's care. Nine days after this after she'd been discharged Mary Therese brought her back into hospital for scolding all over her head and face. So what had happened you may ask? Well Victoria was so itchy because of her scabies that she ran the boiling water tap, she proceeded to put her entire head under this boiling water tap and she scalded herself. Of course she did. You're telling me that a seven-year-old little girl has, to stop itching, full-on put her face under boiling water and kept it there, might I add, because the degree of the burns weren't just a quick sort of put your hand under, ouch that burns, pull it away. It wasn't anything like that. She was pretty badly burnt so you're telling me that this seven-year-old girl has put her head under that has not felt any pain because obviously it would have been killing her to actually remove it quickly she's just sat there and let it burn her and this was all just to stop her itching her injuries were horrific and i'm not going to put the pictures up but if you search up a name they are pretty much everywhere so they are very hard to avoid but if you want to look at them, please do search up a name and you'll find them quite easily. But I must say the one thing that stood out mainly to me, she had these horrific burns on her head and face. But in the photo, she was still smiling. She has this big cheesy grin. And in this horrific photo, she's got this huge smile on her face. And it's just so sad. It's just heartbreaking. This little girl was being abused so badly. And yet she was still smiling. She was still trying to enjoy her life as best as she could. It's just so awful. So the nurses take her to recuperate from her burns. 
and they give her this pink pair of wellies for her to play in. She's dancing around the corridors in this little dress and these pink wellies. She's twirling around the wards and everyone notices how happy this little girl is. And she was just described as this little ray of sunshine. So despite everything she was going through when she wasn't with her, she was just so happy. But the nurses did note a change in her when Mary Therese came to visit. They regarded the relationship more uh, like a master and servant kind of thing, rather than a mother and daughter. One did actually note that there was an injury on her that looked kind of like a belt buckle. And one time when Marie Therese came to Victoria, she was that frightened that she actually wet herself. And how anyone can see this and not think anything of it, I just, I just can't. I really can't understand it. During her fortnight stay at hospital, social services never once asked Victoria what had happened. Everything was just overlooked. Also, while they were there, the doctors found no evidence whatsoever of scabies, which was the sole reason behind these injuries that Mary Therese had given. And yet, even despite this, Victoria was discharged into Mary Therese and Carl's care once more. Doctors did believe that Victoria was being abused, abused, but they incorrectly thought that the police and social services were aware about it. A police constable was actually assigned to check up on Victoria, but PC Karen Jones didn't visit the flat because she was scared of catching scabies from the furniture. Along with this, no health visitor made a follow-up after her hospital admission. And because they were now living with Carl, this was considered that it was his counsel's problem, which was Haringer. And they assigned her a social worker who was called Lisa Arthurie. And Lisa had only recently been qualified. She only had about 18 months experience. She needed to be closely supervised on this case, but she wasn't. And that's not her fault by any means. Normally with severe cases such as this of severe child abuse, they kind of give it to those with the most experience and who've had sometimes decades on the job. And Lisa was very new to this job. She hadn't really been exposed to how bad it can be. In August, Lisa makes her first of two visits to Carl Manning's flat. So while she was there, the flat was kind of well presented. It was a lot better than some of the flats she'd seen before. Victoria and Carl and Mary Therese were very well presented, but Lisa never actually spoke to Victoria during this visit. I mean, I'm not being funny, but a child abuser isn't going to openly admit that they abuse their child. So maybe she would have spoke to Victoria, maybe she would have said something, but on the other hand, she'd not said anything before, so maybe she wouldn't. Either way, she should have spoken to Victoria, and she also didn't even address the fact that Victoria wasn't receiving an education. Lisa's second visit came in October, and this was just days after Carl was basically forcing Victoria to sleep in the bath every night. She was that scared due to her beatings, and basically her body was failing she'd become incontinent. She had soiled her sofa bed so badly that they just threw it away and they didn't get her another one. He just made her sleep in the bath instead. He would tie her hands and her feet and then he would then tie her into a black bag and then make her force her to sleep in the bathtub. She was incontinent so obviously she couldn't help it when she went to the toilet so she would often lie for hours in her own excrement in a room with no heat no lights she wasn't allowed any covers and it was winter she would have been so cold the pair would come in and put food on a plastic plate and because her hands were tied she couldn't obviously eat it so she would actually eat by pushing her face into the plate like a dog would but a dog normally wouldn't be tied up inside of a black bag Marie Therese is now avoiding hospitals. She doesn't want any more suspicion on her. So instead, she takes Victoria to church where she tells them that Victoria's condition has been caused by devils. Everyone saw these injuries and miraculously, they also believed her too. And all they did was pray for her. In November, Marie Therese actually rang Haringey's social services and she was crying down the phone basically saying that Carl Manning had sexually assaulted her daughter, Anna. Now, three days before this, Lisa had actually told them that they wouldn't get a better housing situation unless they thought that Victoria was at risk. So all three of them go in, 
including Carl, who has apparently just sexually assaulted Victoria. They have this discussion. They didn't really think it through because obviously Carl would have to be arrested. Victoria would have to be put through a rape and sexual assault kit. And whether it happened or not, I don't know. But she quickly withdraw, withdrew her allegations. Once more, using poor Victoria to try and better her own life while she was destroying hers. The council didn't investigate this and instead she was allowed back into the care. Into the care of the man who 10 minutes ago was sexually abusing her. Go figure. There were 15 actions that Lisa should have taken next and she did do them. She wrote to them, she wrote letters, she left messages, she constantly called and texted them and she even called round in her own time after work to try and make a face-to-face -face visit but everything was ignored. For the remaining four months of Victoria's short life, Victoria was just on her own. She was starved and tortured daily. Lisa did actually contact the police, I believe, but I'm not sure where that went wrong because nothing was actually done about it. On the 18th of February in 2000, Lisa sent her a last warning to her family, basically saying that if they didn't respond, Anna's case would be closed. A week later, on the 25th of February 2000, with no successful contact, made with Victoria. Harrington Council closed the Victoria Columbia case but at this point it was already too late because the day before on the 24th of February Marie Therese took Victoria to a church once again. A pastor actually saw Victoria's condition and he insisted that she needed to be taken to hospital. He ordered them a taxi because basically she kept drifting in and out of consciousness. And when the taxi came, they were that worried about her that they took her straight round to an ambulance station. Victoria was rushed to hospital where she was transferred to the ICU unit. And she was suffering from so many things that they didn't even know what to treat first. Her body temperature was that low that they didn't even have a thermometer that went that low so that they could actually take it. Her hypothermia was just that bad. She had so many visual injuries and she was, like I said, just falling in and out of consciousness still. They all knew she was dying and they literally did everything they could to save this little girl. But sadly at 3.15pm on the 25th of February in 2000, Victoria Climbier passed away at just the age of 8 years and 3 months old. An inquest was being done into her actual cause of death, but they did arrest Marie Therese there and then on suspicion of murder. Victoria had over 128 separate injuries throughout her tiny little body. These included the ligature marks on her hands and wrists, the cigarette burns, the marks on her back and legs, cuts, bruises, burns, injuries that were caused by being hit with a variety of different weapons. She was just so malnourished and she just she had multiple organ failure. Her body just it couldn't cope with it all. She had that many things wrong with her, it just it gave up. Her actual cause of death was determined as hypothermia. And her body eventually was taken back to her family in the Ivory Coast so they could bury her properly. Marie Therese in questioning was very uncooperative. She kept saying, I've lost my child, I can't be doing an interview. Carl Manning was also arrested the very next day. And on one hand, where Marie Therese was denying everything, Carl admitted to everything. He said he hit her with bike chains, shoes, wires, belts, along with his own hands. He said that Marie Therese also used these same weapons but on occasion, she would also use a hammer. I can't imagine the kind of damage that a hammer would cause a normal child's body. But Victoria's was so malnourished, so frail, that it would just be awful to even think how much damage a hammer would cause to that. When the forensics got to Carl's flat, they found loads of bottles of bleach and basically the flat had been cleaned from top to bottom. Cal was arrested the next day, so he used his time to clean up as much evidence as he could. We managed to recover many, many samples of blood. Now, given that they'd already been cleaned, I think that gave an indication of, of exactly what had, what had happened there. She had been assaulted regularly and severely, and she bled. And even though they'd attempted to cover this up, it must have been in abundance. Even though he had tried, they did find traces of blood on the walls, on pretty much every piece of furniture, and also in the bath. Bits of tape were found in the bin that had been used to tie up Victoria's hands. They also found Victoria's, well, Anna's passport. And this is when they realised the photos didn't even match. This girl on this passport of Anna was not the girl that they had in the hospital. So really they didn't even know her identity. They didn't know 
who it was that they actually had in the hospital because clearly this wasn't her, this, this passport was fake. They searched and searched for her biological parents and it was weeks before they finally did find them and they had to tell them that the little girl had literally been tortured and beaten to death and her family had to fly over to England to identify her body. The trials began on the 20th of November in 2000 and they were being charged with child cruelty and murder. Mary Therese pleaded not guilty, whereas Carl Manning pleaded not guilty to murder but guilty to the other charges. During the trial, Carl's diary was actually used as evidence and in it he'd actually referred to Victoria as Satan and he said that no matter how hard he hit her, that she never cried and she never showed any signs that she was hurt. Marie then claimed that all of the injuries were caused because she was possessed by demons. In January 2001, both Mary Therese and Carl Manning were found guilty of child cruelty and murder for Victoria Columbia and both were sentenced to life in prison. In total, I believe there were 12 occasions where people in authority or things like that could have actually stepped in to save Victoria. Warning phone calls never followed up on, checks not made, on stories that were told by Victoria's great aunt, medical misdiagnosis and throughout just a total lack of communication with the little girl that was at the centre of it all. They just never bothered to ask her. A lot of people that actually did fail Victoria, just as a little note, did lose their jobs and rightly so. This little girl depended on them to do the jobs that they had been trained to do and that they were there for and they just didn't do it and it cost this poor girl her life. I know it can be easy to blame them, obviously the entire blame doesn't land on them. If Carl and Mary Therese hadn't done any of this then they wouldn't have needed to step in but they did and so they were expected to step in but they just didn't. There were many changes made after this case too. The Children Act 2004 made a number of key changes to the child protection framework. Further changes were made by the Children and Social Act 2017, which amended the 2004 Act in a number of, of areas and I really do think that her family, although utterly devastated and heartbroken at the loss of their daughter, are proud that she didn't die in vain and that these changes were made as a result of what happened to her and that they would make things better for other children. This case was the most horrific child abuse case that I've personally looked into before and just the torture that she endured but the fact that she was always still smiling and always tried to be a happy bubbly self. Just heartbreaking really. Victoria's father Francis says that he doesn't regard Victoria's life as lost because the chance it created to change childcare in the system for the better. He and his wife did actually start a campaign to build a school for children in the Ivory Coast. It's hoped that they, with providing education there, parents won't feel as inclined to have to send the children away. Their dream has actually become a reality and their newly built school now teaches 360 children, which is just amazing. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know this was a very heavy case and it was just utterly horrific what happened to Victoria. But for me, it was a suggested case, which is why I covered it. So I'm sorry if any of you thought it was too much. Cases like this are just so sad, especially when children are involved and they do leave you feeling low and sad, with myself included. If you have any more suggestions you'd like me to look into, please do let me know and look into them. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you like this content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Victoria Columbia. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.